First 18 months, we didn't make money. I didn't have any money. I left a big job. I was struggling. We have loving in 16 entities. We did 8.4 million gross revenue last year, 5.4 million net revenue, 23% operating profit, $1.4 million profit. Your page promoted an event for Andrew Tate mm. after he got canceled from social media. Mm. But a week after the post got deleted. Yeah, we do try and cover most things that are talked about in Dubai, but we decided particularly that Andrew Tate was toxic in terms of how people reacted to him. What was the size of the company when you first started it? It was me. It was me and a, and a laptop. The plan for Augustus was always to be a regional company and market entry is tricky right and for the first three years we changed the color of the love and saudi website three times we changed the name we changed the language uh we now have love and saudi a bill arabi and green yeah our reach and our audience uh nearly a billion video views last year six million social followers and it's a 20 30 40 year project it's not like no exit no yeah it's just long-term project Welcome guys to another episode. Today we've got a true successful businessman, a true successful story. My man Richard, the founder and CEO of Love in Dubai, Augustus Media and Love in Saudi and many, many more. How's your day been? It's been great. Yeah, glad to be here at the end of the day on a Saturday. But as we were talking, like when you're an entrepreneur, when you're running your own stuff, like it's just nonstop. So yeah, all Absolutely. good. Absolutely. So when I looked at your resume, Honestly, I was quite impressed, like a true, true successful entrepreneur. But before we get into it, because like I'm a big fan and I'm really impressed, tell us a little bit about your background, your upbringings. Yeah, so uh, I'm Irish. I was born in the southeast coast of Ireland in 1983. So that makes me 40 this year in July. Uh, and uh, uh, came from a biggish Irish family, uh, studied in Dublin. Uh, graduated in 2006 with, you know, a standard economics German degree and was reading newspapers uh, in my granny's great aunt's farmhouse about social media on Sundays. And I was kind of like, I need to maneuver my way into this industry. And uh, I got a job somehow after another job in a digital agency in Dublin. And two and a half years there, you know, I could talk about career or whatever, but I could see that they weren't really moving fast enough in social media. Uh, and I saw London was moving faster. So I, I kind of made sure that I got into the kind of leading social media agency in London in 2009, 2010. And then from there, I then, uh, you know, was progressing, right? Like gradually. Uh, and then uh, I joined a bigger company. And then uh, in 2012, I moved to Dubai, an opportunity to be a director in social media at, at the age of 28, 29. Did that for three years. Luckily, it was a well-established company. Uh, it got me to, you know, we talked about your background, but it got me to spend time in Saudi, in Iraq, in North Africa, in Lebanon, in Jordan. So I, I was managing social media across all these countries. We had 12 offices and I got to basically build my own team. So I got all that entrepreneurial stuff going on, right? I was handling a, basically a business unit. I created my own p and I did all that sort of stuff. So when uh, I always kind of wanted to set up an agency, I thought like, you know, do this for 10 years and then you sort of maybe reach a ceiling. Uh, either some people get tired of it or whatever, but I don't really like to think you get tired of something. You know, why do, why do you get tired? Like, so uh, I then uh, basically a friend of mine was setting up Love in Dublin uh, or had done and I asked him what he was doing and with it, uh, expanding it, so I ended up, I joined an MD as a startup and then I licensed this from him. I wrote a 10 year area developer agreement and about a year doing two jobs, owning one company and MD of another, I then moved full time into the Augustus, which was, which owned Love in Dubai and Love in for the region and uh, grew from there. And now like, you know, fast forward seven and a half years, we're 70 people, we have Love in in 16 entities uh we have offices three big offices in the region and we have one person in four more countries uh we did 8.4 million gross revenue last year 5.4 million net revenue 23 percent operating profit 1.4 million dollars profit 
and uh, we have a streaming service, Smashy TV. We've launched Smashy Sports. We're the broadcaster and distributor with federations in the UAE for futsal, volleyball, and handball. Uh, and yeah, our reach and our audience, uh, nearly a billion video views last year, six million social followers. And uh, yeah, just that exciting sort of, you know, we've built a 12,000 square foot studios in Dubai Production City, cost a million dollars fit out. You know, it sounds like I'm just throwing out numbers, but it's like, that's all incremental. First 18 months, we didn't make money. I didn't have any money. I left a big job. I was struggling. Like, it, you know, we didn't take other than $140,000. We didn't never took outside money. We reinvested 80% of our profits every year from 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. We made money in 2020. Uh, not as much as other years, but we made money. Uh, I could tell how we did that in the pandemic. And then 2021 reinvested again and uh, our mission is to become the modern media company of choice in the Middle East and North Africa and we're just zen like focused to do digital this region and to do our own content our own audiences and it's a 20 30 40 year project it's not like no exit no yeah it's just long term project so what was the size of the company when you first started it it was me it was me and a, and a laptop and then you know I, I hired one editor uh, on expensive money and realized that that wasn't the right approach and I hired a junior salesperson and they that didn't work and then to keep the business going when I left my job I won some other business like social media retainers and uh if I didn't have that skill from my previous role, I don't know how we would have kept going. Because it, even though in the first month in September 2015, we had a quarter of a million page views, because I knew how to do clickbait. I knew how to write listicles and the Facebook algorithm and juice. Like I knew how to do that. And I did, like even though I can't really write, like I'm not brilliant, like a, you know, I'm not an editor, but I knew how to do lists. I knew how to do 23 reasons you need to visit Dubai once before you die and this sort of stuff. And I knew how to promote that and get page views. So we had those page views, but, and we kept those page views for a year and, but we couldn't sell any advertising. And I had every contact in media agencies and I couldn't get even a friend to book a campaign, you know? So, uh, a year in, we'd run out of the money. We'd run out of that money. And I was pretty much broke. Like, uh, and I started winning some social media retainers. And when I did that, then I hired people to serve those accounts. So I, I could go back and I could clickbait and grow the yep. audience. And I would just go into a co-working space in JLT for 12 hours a day and just publish all the time, every day of the week and grow and grow and grow. And by the end of 2016, uh, we started doing some small packages with restaurants, like 3000 dirhams, an article with 3000 page views and things like that. And then I was able to hire one sales guy and then I was able to hire one writer and it just grew. And, you know, you've in that co-working space in Astrolabs, you could have five visas and five desks. And then we, we found an 800 square foot that we could eventually have 11. So those five people moved into an office that it was like a little tiny little office, like with a tiny corner toilet, like and we didn't even have a space for a receptionist. But six, seven months later, we needed uh, an office assistant so we like she was sitting inside the door Taz's name she's been with us since like she's grown and grown and grown now in, higher up in the company and operations and like everything is a story like that and then you know a year later by january 2019 uh we had 11 people uh and then we needed to move somewhere else so we moved into a 2000 square foot unit in cluster I on the 40 something floor that overlooked Palm Jumeirah and Ain Dubai and all that and the Marina skyline. So that view became the boardroom in there became our studio. And we did something like you do here with cameras and lights. Right. And we launched the Love in Dubai show and it's been running since big, big podcast and it's a good show. And, uh, and then I told the guys we're 11 people walking in and they were just like, this is nice. It's a big space. Cause they were so used to this cramped <laughs> little office. And I told them that, you know, we're moving into here now, but the idea is to grow out of it. On day one, I said, we have to grow out of this space. And during the pandemic, I felt like an idiot saying that. <laughs> but then a year out after the pandemic, we were like, okay, we're not ready now to grow out of it. We're up to 23 visas and we were kind of maxed. And then I started scoping around for different reasons. We choose Production City. 
So we went from 2,000 square feet to 12,000. And now the idea isn't to grow out of the space that we're in. The idea is to grow into it. Like, because we're only 20 people, we can have 60 people. So we need to, we need to use these. We have five studios. We need to use the space. And we, we spent money in the fit out, as I mentioned. We want to grow, go this over 10, 10 years or so. But in the meantime, in 2017, uh, when we were still under the franchise agreement, um, I wanted to do something in Saudi. So I, we launched Love in Sou- Saudi. I was going to ask you that. You're brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> You're brilliant. I was actually going to ask you about that. Yeah. yeah. Please tell, me, tell us how, how did the idea came into expa- expanding into Saudi Arabia? How did it come about? Did someone from there reach out to you like, we want something like what's happening in Dubai? over there in Saudi? So when I was a year or two younger than you, so about the time, about the age you were when you left London, I was sitting in London in my desk in London and guys from Mindshare came to visit and they were speaking to one of my bosses who was moving over here and I moved uh, in the same company. And I met them in in a members club in London and they were the Saudi MD and the Saudi heads of digital of this group. And they told me, uh, they, they, they were reporting to the Dubai MD and they were seeing if this 27, 28 year old Irish kid in London could be the social media director for all their big clients, for Zayn, the telco, for HSBC or Saab and Saudi, for uh, Al Safi Danone, for Nissan, for Infinity. Massive for, brands. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Rani Refreshments, which is Ojan, which is Coca Cola and, and Barbican and all these ones. And it goes on and on, like Kleenex, uh, IBM, everything. And uh, they reported back saying, no, he's going to get eaten alive. <laughs> he's going to get shouted <laughs> at. And, but I got the job. And in the first three years, I was in and out of Saudi a lot. And I was shouted at a lot. And, uh, but uh, I kind of wanted to crack it. I knew, I knew what, it, what it meant as a market in this region. And I also knew from that experience of going to Beirut a lot and going to Cairo and going to Amman and stuff like that, that, you know, to, this region for me wasn't two million people, you know, and putting their hands into it like narrow minded in right. Dubai. This region to me was was that exposure that I had in those three years. So the the plan for Augustus is always to be a regional company. And market entry is tricky, right? And for the first three years, we changed the color of the Love and Saudi website three times. We changed the name, we changed the language. Uh, we now have love in Saudi, Abel Arabi in green, and we have love in, there's 13 regions. There is also love in Jeddah. Yeah, love, love in Riyadh, Riyadh. Love in Sharkia, which it covers. And Dama they're all Hummer. under the entity of love in Saudi, right? Yeah, yeah. So we've got Augustus uh, uh, Saudi. So Augustus is a 100% owned entity in Saudi Arabia. It's the first foreign owned media company, 100%. Yeah, I can imagine. You know, we were the kind of, we were the, guinea pig on that sagia which is now called invest not guinea pig but we were the, we were the first people to to be tested out in that format through astrolabs they were the first ones that they said let's we know you guys from dubai let's see if we can do it with you and uh you know that's how we op- that's how we set up last year in in egypt as well actually in the middle of 2021 but and so uh so saudi was a tricky one because it's such a you know doing love in dubai and trying to replicate that like it's hard it's hard and it's hard to do that Khaliji dialect in the in the same way and it's also uh hard to get product market fit in anything right like so gradually though we kept on working on it and we did it by hiring young saudi media graduates and we now have the biggest snap shows in saudi arabia we've one called Mimin kester social media which got you know, six billion and four billion top snap views in the last two years, uh, and delivers a lot of revenue from us. We, for us, we have seven Snapchat shows in the Snapchat Discover section that we do four minute production episodes uh, twice a week on these channels. So we're we're really like we really are a modern production company in, in media, uh, right. and uh, and yeah, our, now our Saudi office is, you know, for the first three years we lost money. Uh, we made over a million dollars in revenue last year in Saudi and it's up to sort of 12, 13 people. But we've been helped by, you know, during the pandemic, there was an initi- there was initiatives that helped support salaries for Saudi nationals. Then now there's more initiatives to get Saudis employed. Into the market, yeah. Yeah, and I love seeing it. I love seeing young people 
uh wanting to grow wanting to learn i love the attitude it's just it's really refreshing and um you know it kind of goes against that stereotype like in my old company they were like don't hire saudis you know put them on the payroll to keep clients happy but don't hire them (laughs) in the office really and this was what i was told and um i remember going to misc is a foundation in saudi under mbs uh hamad zaman and the the crown prince so uh so they had a MISC media forum or MISC uh, global forum. MISC. Yeah, M I S K. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so it's a foundation. But I remember go- speaking at one of those events with three thousand graduates, and this was in twenty seventeen or twenty eighteen. I was we had set up there, and I was just like, I'm just going to hire these people, you know. Yeah. And we and we do, and some of them leave and go on work for the biggest TV channels in Saudi Arabia and uh you know and we keep on hiring them like and it's slow steady growth we're not a big player like we're not like nbc or any of these big saudi companies uh but like we're patient and we like what we're doing and you know uh you're enjoying the process yeah and 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 saudi's just so like i love what's happening there because i love that uh you know people talk about saudi from a uh, outside of of saudi arabia and, and and the kingdom and they kind of have some views in that and i think like what's happening is it's a domestic story it's 25 yes. million saudis who've never been to al ula right like the you know it's right. it's not about tourism from elsewhere it's not about convincing the westerners and that's one of the things that i pretty much decided early doors with augustus media who cares about the west or whatever like uh we want to create media for people here and content for people here uh, you know, and I fully embrace that. Like I'm not brilliant at languages, but I just I I teach myself and I practice Arabic no, every day. You've, you've done really well because yeah. what what you guys also basically do is you showcase areas and cities in the country that the locals didn't even know about before. Mm. Like you know, when I look at uh, Al Ola and I see like some of the images and the videos, I'm like, wow. Did that place actually exist in Saudi Arabia? Yeah. Like, it's it's mind-blowing what you guys do, and it's beautiful. And I feel like when I look at your brand as an outsider, I feel like your brand, all right, it's a local, like, it's a newspaper or digital news. At the same time, I feel it's a brand that showcases the country and the region. True. To, to the West world, to the Westerners, right? Yeah, you've hit on something right there in that, like, our lens or our media lens is loving your life, so... You know, people say is media uh, impartial. Well, no, we're we're intentionally positive. We're intentionally pro. We, uh, so that's why we hire people who are from the place. Like we hire people who grew up in Dubai because we want people to really, it to come from the horse's mouth in terms of like, we want them to believe what they're writing. Right. I want them, it's important. Be passionate that, about it. Exactly. We want, you know, if someone is critical of the kingdom, if someone's critical of Riyadh as it's not a livable city, then uh, someone who grew up there will kind of go, well, no, actually, I kind of like it living here. You know what I mean? And it's yeah. the same in Dubai, right? Like everyone can be positive about Dubai, but that, you know, and that's why, that's you know, you know, yes, we do promote, we do show nice content from these places. Um, and different parts of Saudi, like the Jizan region and, and lots of parts. But uh, but also, you know, we're lucky that a lot, there's a lot of good content creators out there. There's a lot of people we collaborate with. You know, you know, we're not the only ones with a, with a phone in Saudi Arabia with a camera, right? right? Like, but we have sort of, um, you know, went along with this sort of, uh, you know, this Vision 2030 and all the different initiatives and programs that are happening. But yeah, it's fascinating and uh, it's, it's fun what we're doing. So Richard, I've looked at your resume. And I can see you start off as a salesman. How did that help you develop your career or the person you are today? When I went to get into advertising, I got a job with outdoor uh, advertising company and I did some sales for them. And that helped me get the foot in the door into digital marketing. Sales and marketing are very linked. Uh, for me, they're in the same sort of family with PR. They're very linked. So it was the, it was the only job I could get into advertising. Uh, and then I sort of quickly went from there. I, I did an extra course in the evening on digital marketing. And then I, I, with that one year experience, I got into uh, a digital agency, the biggest digital agency in Ireland. So, but I never did sort of uh, full on sales, but I always think of them quite linked together. Like over my career, they are. I, you know, yeah, right. They're very linked and in, in advertising, 
you have to do a lot of pitches you have to do a lot of business development so uh yeah you you kind of have to find ways to generate revenue right but i i definitely approach it from a solving clients problems point of view in terms of marketing and i'm not i'm not the clinical sort of uh salesperson like i actually maybe i'm not a great salesperson i'm actually kind of a better marketer but yeah because why why i personally believe if you're good at sales you're good at talking to people that like can help you be a successful businessman or entrepreneur because mm. like you said earlier on you were selling to restaurants and you were selling to convincing local restaurants to buy into one of your products when you start your when you start yeah, with your loving, yeah loving right. to buy, yeah that's amazing so i've got a question right and some of the people that they've asked me to ask you this question right so back t- back in september your page promoted an event for Andrew Tate mm. after he got cancelled from social media. Mm. But a week after, the post got deleted. Yeah. Can you please tell us more about that? Yeah, so I think what you're referring to is there was an event approved by Dubai Tourism that he was going to perform in Dubai and uh, we announced it. And the event was cancelled and we were asked to remove the post. A week later, when things calmed down a bit, we wrote a full explanation article to say what happened, why it was cancelled and why he's in Dubai and why he's leaving. And our journalists did that matter of fact, she reportedly. Uh, There was backlash initially on that post and there was backlash on Twitter. These things happen. Um, I think what we decided at that point is we do try and cover most things that are talked about in Dubai, but we decided particularly that Andrew Tate was toxic in terms of how people reacted to him while he was here. So we did it, we reported it, it's on our website, it's a matter of fact, uh, And but we're not a platform that wants to uh, upset any community in Dubai and we don't want, you know, sometimes social media is a place where people right. get triggered and people go off on but comments. But you're not going to please everybody, you can't. You can't please everybody, but I think you can, I think if your platform is really big, you need a responsibility that you don't want to, that you don't want to unsettle any sort of communities. Yeah, people are going to go at each other and, and have different views on stuff. And I think, you know, social media is in bands, right? Like, I think to a degree, with once you sort of respect uh, people's faith, once you respect the leadership and once you respect people's um, ability to make a living and you don't sort of ruin... Of course. Their, you know, once once you sort of do that... The basics. Yeah, basic. if, if we do that as a platform and if people do that on the comment section, then then that's fine. Now if, now, if we don't do that as a platform, then we should be reprimanded or we should apologize or we should correct ourselves, which we do. And if people uh, also you know, breach one of those three things that I outlined, then that's our community guidelines and that stuff gets removed. So basically. what's your actual thoughts on him? You know, honestly, I don't know him, right? I, I No, I don't know him. I haven't seen his content. I'm not a massive personal user of TikTok. And I didn't know of him. Someone had to tell me a year ago, do you know Andrew Tate? And I had to Google him. Like, I didn't know him. Like, so uh, I've seen some of the stuff he, he says and... I, I understand, I, I follow media, so I understand why people in the US are removed from platforms. And uh, so I understand, I always see when, you know, people remove people from platforms. So that's that's my in, and then I kind of try and understand what they've said. So I think, you know, I, I guess when people do things that are removed from platforms, then there's obviously some stuff there that's in breach of platform guidelines. I think you have to respect things. It's like respecting countries and stuff like that. And if you're on a platform, you kind of have to respect the rules of those platforms. Yeah, you should be careful in how you deliver your message. I mean, I haven't got anything against him. Like, I agree with some of the stuff he says, but I don't agree with every single word that comes out of his mouth. But yeah, I think that video went really viral and I was reading the comments that day and like people were having a go at your page why disgusting etc etc anyways moving on to my next question so you've been an entrepreneur for a long time so what's been your biggest lesson in three words during your entrepreneurship journey uh lessons uh i think you learn like you you're saying you know off the air you told me about your entrepreneurship journey and about 
you know, being humble and uh, rec- removing ego and things like that. And I, I listened to you. I liked hearing that. Uh, I, I've made leadership mistakes in that company that I explained earlier. I've definitely done things that uh, I look back on now and I go a more mature experience. Richard would uh, have done that differently. And I think it's, you know, by adopting a learning mentality, by being open to learning, helps so much you know and i didn't have that in my 20s and i have that now and it helps me with audio books it helps me with um taking advice and listening you know and and like listening isn't about uh like you're doing now it's not a body position like listening is actually not sort of asserting your experience on someone else it's trying to see what their actual experience is to understand before you diagnose and too often people are quiet and then they give their experience. They don't back. actually listen. Right. Well, That's yeah. so true. They think they think the word listening, they think they're doing it. But that's the wrong word because what you need to do is you need to understand. And like, that's just like one example, but I don't want to dive into too much. But, you know, lessons is just if you can if you can design your life, if you can have an approach that allows things to happen, you know, uh, when I was younger, I used to, when I was a kid, I had lots of siblings and I would always sort of get triggered by them. And, you know, uh, like I didn't have a great reputation in school and stuff like that. And uh, people, when they see me now, they go, is that the same guy as 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 that Richard who was seven and who was a little, you know, a little terrier or whatever? And they're kind of, you know, and, and that comes from just, well, maturity and changing and learning. But so there's lessons along the way. There's those lessons. Absolutely. I, I get lessons every day. I'm I'm humble every day. I'm, I'm slapped in the face every day. So yeah. <laughs> there is this Arabic uh, saying. It says, "The teacher dies." Like, no, the teacher. <laughs> even, even if you know, oh my God, how can, can you say it in Arabic, to, please? You uh, المعلم ولسه ما تعلم means the teacher dies and he still hasn't learned everything in okay. life. Okay. Even though he was a teacher, he's been a teacher all his life. When he dies, still there is stuff that he hasn't actually yeah. learned. Yeah. And life is a school and you got to enjoy the journey. Hello, I just want to talk to you quickly about this beautiful massage gun from Game Hunter Store GHS. What I love about this absolute beautiful tool that is so light on the hand and I can take it with me wherever I go. I love the fact that it's got a touch screen and pay a different level of speeds and vibration. So you can adjust that depending on how you view each day. I love taking it with me wherever I go and I love using it after a heavy session at the gym or even after a long day at the office. What I also love about it is the battery life. It lasts it lasts about 8 to 10 hours of consistent use. Not to mention, right, it comes with this beautiful case and it's got six different type of heads. You can each switch them up depending on how you really feel and which one is you feel better for you for that giving day. Wait, don't go. They've also got this mini massage gun, which is so insane, guys. Look at that. It's literally the size of an iPhone. How insane is that? It's so light. You don't feel like you're actually holding something in your hand. This is my favorite. I love taking it with me wherever I go. I can literally fit it with my pocket if I want to. Guys, if you like what you're seeing, you can get 10% off by watching this episode. The discount code is TIC10. Use that when you go on GameHunterStore.com. What's the most exciting project you're working on now at the moment that people don't know about? I think I'm, I'm quite excited about the sports streaming stuff. I know it's tricky, but I, I like we, we launched Smashy, a streaming service two or three years ago, and we tried to get people like Bloomberg. We tried to make it a young person's version right. of Bloomberg, the TV part. And so I can stream uh, uh, football, watching football ma- matches through your platform. You can some sports, not football yet. Okay. Uh, we actually do the broadcast. We don't have the rights for football yet in this region, but we're working on it. And I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the future media, future trends. Uh, there's, I'm, you know, it's a it's a vertical video year. Like I'm, I like the stuff that you're doing. I like the stuff that you know we're trying to do. I'm just excited about the region. I'm excited Absolutely. about what we're doing. Uh, I'm excited about working with young people, figuring things out. Um, you know, every market that we get into uh, to sort of navigate it needs patience. Like Egypt now is going through a difficult time uh, with the currency devaluation and and we've nearly 25 people on the ground there and uh, finding the right leadership there and looking after those, those people while they have uh, economic 
uncertainty is tricky right like Absolutely. and so uh but i'm excited about it it's not it's it's not um necessarily answering the question but those th kind of things keep me uh trying to figure things out what's the best way to approach things right so that's like if i if i were to ask you the secrets of chasing your passion that would be your answer what you just said secrets of chasing passion would be uh discipline discipline yeah if you have discipline uh yeah if, discipline to do the same routine every day longevity uh get that mission down on paper and don't stray from it Keep discipline going. is really hard and discipline is getting things done when you don't feel like absolutely doing them it's really hard it's about putting your emotions on the side and just like staying focused and one of the things that i'm striving for to do this year is staying consistent and being disciplined every single day but sometimes things that can happen out of your control like a death of a loved one or something like that right relate to health that's out of your control that can keep you off track but other than that just gotta be disciplined things will keep you off track anyway but i think i wouldn't put it just depends on the language right but putting emotions to a side i think you know what i learned uh you know was that if you can understand your emotions if you I read lots of books about emotional intelligence and it, it kind of made me sort of understand those things that sort of cause stress. And if, if you can not put them to the side, but you said, use the words that you can't control. Well, you can actually, you can control your emotions. Uh, you can't change them immediately, but you can recognize them and be aware, self-awareness. And once you kind of have that, uh, then, uh, then a lot of things become manageable they don't you you don't solve them immediately you know there are externalities obviously like deaths and uh, tragic situations and things you can't control uh but but again it goes back to that point about learning right and about that lovely arabic phrase that you said about uh you know about not being able to think and having that ego that you're going to learn everything in the future no but like i'm not preaching here i'm kind of going well if i embrace learning and the learning that i've done has allowed me to uh control emotions a little bit which allows me to have discipline and believe myself i used to think i could be the guy that could be consistent that could train you know almost every day of the year I used to think that was just a footballer or someone who made it in the 20s, right? I didn't think that I could have the discipline. And now here I am, like five years or six years into, well, eight years into a triathlon journey, and, and uh, it just keeps going. I keep, I keep doing longer distances. I keep doing these you events. You're also an angel investor, right? So what are the quality you look for in a business or an entrepreneur before making an investment? So I have a, uh, I call it Fitzy Fund. It's a personal investment approach. I wouldn't necessarily classify it as angel investor, although you know, I know that's on my LinkedIn. It's just the ticket size that I've gone in and so far has been angel investment, but I don't see it as an angel fund. I see it more as a, a media investments in emerging markets. So a lot of the things that I'm exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis, if I brought them all into under Augustus, we might fail and we might not have enough capital to grow those products. Uh, so I like to sort of dabble in other things and invest personally in the things that I think have got a chance. Uh, you know, whether it's a podcast platform in Lebanon called Podio, whether it's plant-based news out of the UK, whether it's uh, Nifty, Nifty Souk, which is an NFT platform for the region, or Balkis for Her, which is a female platform for Saudi Arabia. Uh, purely in Arabic, so and Bongo uh, BD, which is a streaming service in Bangladesh. Like these are the types of things that I look at. Uh, when I went public with this about a year ago, the deal flow was really, really good, and it gets me. Like last night, I had a one-hour call with a Brazilian guy in California who's built uh, a, a, an audio, a fiction audio app that's talking to Disney about doing a Indiana Jones series on their platform and. It, it's just interesting for me. I'm speaking to other kind of comic audio companies. Um, I get to I get to look around media and go, okay. And like you're in you're in different types of trading, but you know, in equities, I look at all the media stocks. I look at the values of all their companies. I look at the price to earnings ratio. I look at um, you know the obviously their share price and 
Um, and then I, I, I have a small equities in, in a lot of those companies just so I can get the investor report. So I, so I'm more familiar other than being a journalist to attend their shareholders calls so I can learn. Nice. And what advice would you give to young entrepreneurs? So our values of Augustus are tenacity, ingenuity, and velocity. Tenacity is about never giving up. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, when I was like at my desk in those agencies over the years, I always told myself the harder you work today, the more you will be reward rewarded tomorrow, uh, rewarded tomorrow. So, and same, like when I'm doing these endurance triathlons, I just keep going. Right. So that's, I think that's good entrepreneurial in a career or entrepreneurial Velo velocity is about creating momentum. You have to create momentum, whether it's, you know, whether it's sending a hundred emails, you have to create those opportunities for yourself, whether it's having a meeting with someone and following up with actions, that's about momentum, right. right? And you can only, the thing about momentum is you can't have momentum on everything and you can't have momentum all the time. So you have to choose the time to generate momentum. If you're playing tennis or if you're in football, it's known as putting people under pressure, having that momentum. And when you have that momentum, you have to score, you have to capitalize, but that's a little bit about like that sort of energy that you need. Uh, we can be consistent with tenacity, right. but we need to create momentum as well. And ingenuity, the third value in the business is all about creativity, believing that everyone's brain is as good as the other person's. And just, you know, that really helps with diversity. It really helps with giving people a chance and believing that we can all do whatever the hell we want, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I don't really, I don't really think that there's within relativity. I don't think there's, uh, certain situations and certain, uh, obstacles that people can actually, uh, make the most of it with the right mindset, growth mindset. I really love that. Really, really loved what you just said. And it's all about building that momentum, but sometimes people struggling, keeping up that momentum, keeping up with the base. So for like then revert back to then revert back to tenacity and just be consistent you can be influential without being at the top of your game if you're if you know you if you you can be five out of ten on your own game okay. Ahmed, tuesday morning is you're not having a good day you can be as influential if you're feeling crap just by getting someone else to do something just by uh, writing an email or creating something just by showing up. Still getting things done. But yeah, but without even doing it yourself because you don't have the energy because you're sitting at the desk, you ate a load of pasta and you're tired. You can still be influential. Just show up. Just go to the meeting. Just walk around that, that office or have that Zoom call and just chat. And you can actually listen or you can learn or you can create, you can be consistent. Just write, just do the things that are easy. But if you just keep going, if you just keep consistent, then there are times when you've got more energy and more momentum to really initiate a project. And then there's times where there's 20 projects and how the hell can you give the same energy eight hours a day to 20 things? You can't. So what you do is you give as much energy as possible to the one that whatever people say the most important thing. But if you do that uh, for, the mo for one thing, most important or not, at least that project's getting done. And then with the other things, you can just initiate those things a little bit. Richard, thank you so much for your time today. I've really enjoyed this episode with you. We've got a tradition in this podcast where the last guest writes a question for the next guest. Where would you see yourself in five years and what made you, you, if that makes sense? Uh, you know, I never sort of get emotionally attached to, to here, but I do see myself in Dubai and, or in the region in five years time. And I see myself running this business in five years time. Uh, I don't think it'll be a, a plain sailing five years, but yeah, inshallah we'll grow and inshallah. get bigger. <laughs> I'm sure it will keep growing. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, that's me in the business. I think uh, both. <laughs>